Welcome to episode 74 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and I'm also a podcaster. You are listening to my podcast. It takes the form of an audio journal of events in the garden. This week's events included the training of a fig tree along the side of the glass house, stringing up some Clematis Montana, cutting back some hellebores, moving some asters, and talking about buds and promises of spring and all of the other late January activities. I'm starting to feel a little bit like one of those boxers you see before a big bout when he's jumping on his toes and punching himself in the head to get himself ready to take some more head punches. That psyched up feeling. The season is beginning. There is a lot ahead of us. I think this year is going to be particularly beautiful and momentous in the garden. So let's get on and hear about preparations for spring in the week in gardening. Welcome to the Week in Gardening, the diary of five cold days in mid-January 2020. Unusually cold for this winter, the ground is still sodden, but for the first part of this week at least, it had a little crisping covering of ice on the top of it, like the, like the hard top of a creme brulee, something you can break through with a teaspoon, but it takes a couple of good whacks. It was pleasant. It felt like January should feel. On Monday, it was it was particularly clear and bright. According to the, the meteorologists, it was a particularly high-pressure weekend, one of the highest for 50 years. I didn't feel particularly crushed by the extra weight of air above me. In fact, I, I felt quite light and, and free in my footsteps, but, but lesser people may have been slightly shorter, I guess. One of the nicest things was the sunrise on Monday morning. What a welcome back to the working week. Maybe it was to do with with the high pressure. I think that, that we'd had a high pressure night and then some of that, that watery marinade, that groundwater that has been sitting around for months, got evaporated up a little bit and some clouds snuck under and then got squashed down into these styrated lines and then the sun came and lit them all up and they looked like like sheets of molten metal had been banged together and some were grey and cooling and some were still burning bright and red and orange. It was wonderful. So I watched that as I cycled up the hill ready to get into the gardening business. I had a a sack with me containing plant training kit. This is the stuff that you see in vineyards and in particularly smart kitchen gardens where they're, where they're pleaching peach trees and things. It's the kit with the galvanised wire and the tensioning turnbuckles, which mean that you can create plant supports that twang like guitar strings when you run your hands down them. They all look perfectly straight and parallel. None of these strange nails hanging out of bits of mortar that you've whacked in and, and taken off quarter of a brick face and shoved something in there and used a bit of old old sock. Actually, I did use a bit of old sock. I'll come on to that later. But you used a bit of a bit of wire you found from a from a packing container to, to tie it on somewhere and you haven't quite been able to reach and the wire's six inches long and straggly. No, this is the geometric, perfect style of pruning. And I brought it in to train a fig across the back of this wonderful little glass house we've got. Our glass house is a very decorative glass house, like you'd see at the Chelsea Flower Show. It's not a productive thing for creating bedding plants by the hundred thousand. It is a thing for looking gorgeous and pottering about on a few heated benches. So I didn't want to drill into the metal frame to train this fig. I wanted a temporary structure that looked permanent and looked part of the greenhouse. And so I hit on a a plan of using the the downpipes from the roof, these nice enameled metal downpipes that sit on each corner of the greenhouse, and stringing the wire between the two of those. And to do so, 
are, I rigged a little system around each drain pipe, consisting of these little little neoprene strips, a little tiny thin rubber strip, and around that, I put on the hose clamp. You know that that metal tensioning wire with the with a little key on it that you used to use to secure hose pipes to taps. You can buy that in, in three meter strips. So I used some of those around the neoprene to protect the drain pipe and created a, a ladder rung system all the way up each drain pipe. And then the wire was strung between those with all of the turnbuckles perfectly aligned. So it looked like the the neck of a, a cello or something and not some ham-fisted gardener's excuse for, oh, that'll do for now, pruning, which is what I, what I normally specialise in. I think it's very attractive. It's got that show-your-working architectural charm, that sort of Lloyd's building effect. The thing I'm, I'm putting in has been in the ground for about two years, and I bought it as a standard, so it goes up on one long straight stem and then starts bursting out in its figgy exuberance and from where the exuberance starts I'm effectively going to to fan train it. I cut it back to five main branches. The bottom two go out onto the bottom wires, the next two go on to the wires above them. They don't go quite out at the horizontal, they go out at a, at a 45 degree angle or so and then there's one branch going straight up in the air and I took the end off each one of those branches so that they will then shoot from the two buds behind and those two buds behind will be trained out. One of them will go straight along the wire they're on already, the other one will go up to the next wire and so on and so forth. In an exponential growth each time they're tied in the amount of branches will double until eventually the garden, the hillside, England, the world, the universe has nothing but trained fig in it. I think this is quite a good time for pruning figs. They say to do it now because then your, your fig doesn't bleed and fig sap is apparently an irritant. But I found that my fig still did bleed, just from the leader, just from the leading bud at the tip of the tallest of those five branches. It's obviously pumping stuff up there already, thinking about getting going. Which I think is quite brave for a, a Mediterranean plant in England in January. Anyway, after the fig had been put into its place, I was on something of a disciplinarian role. So I carried on tying things about. The next thing I tied up was another thing mentioned on the podcast. About two years ago, I was talking about the idea of sending some Clematis Montana up over one of the outbuildings to scramble there to turn the roof into one of those beautiful flowering mats that you get when Clematis Montana manages to get up and over a shed and transform it into something weepingly, weepingly picturesque. And I had the idea to send this, this Clematis, up the side of the building in which we keep our digger and ride-on mower and at the moment lots of dahlias and scarifiers and hollow tine machines and turn the sunny side of the roof into this glorious tapestry. But as you will probably have worked out from that list of equipment in there, it's a big building. This isn't the kind of shed in which you keep a, a fly-mo and a very, very old pair of gardening gloves that have ossified, so solid that if you try and put them on the fingers, snap off. It's not one of those sheds at all, it's, it's, a, it's a proper building. And I've got the Clematis Montana now up and along the side of it, and then under the guttering, and up onto the roof itself. And then once there, there's nothing for those twining leaf stems. Clematis Montana clings using a leaf with a, a very long, modified petiole, which turns around and around the, the thing it wants to grip onto. So it needs a twig or a, a piece of metal, a piece of trellis, someone who's not moving their finger very much, something like that, that it can wrap around. It can't cling onto a, a tile, like a climbing hydrangea, or a, a Boston Ivy, or Virginia Creeper would be able to do. It needs help there. So last growing season, the Clematis Montana reached the roof and there tangled itself in frustration. And it did flower up there, but it flowered in a, in a tangled clump just above the line of the gutter. So on Monday, I climbed up to the roof line of the shed, 
which I realized when I was up there was completely covered in ice still. And I shimmied along this, this icy ridge line. And I drilled into the ridge tiles at various points and put some hooks in. And then I got off and went down to the, to the eaves and there put in some other hooks and then strung the tensioning wire between them, once more turning it from, from barn to, to banjo. And then I was able to, to string the, the clematis up right up almost to the ridge line after untangling that, that knot and tie it in. The perfect system would be to create a trellis across the whole roof in this style, but that would be too ugly. It would mean that you saw all of the hooks on the gable end of the outbuilding as you approached it. This is a much more discreet way of doing things. It means that the clematis is just heading up in a straight line until it gets to the roof ridge, but I'm hoping from there it will, it will grow like it did at the gutters, and then it will cascade back down over itself as if it were covering some Himalayan scree. I didn't realise they were a Himalayan plant for ages because, because of Montana, which obviously just means mountainous, uh, and that's why the state got its name. But for some reason I thought of them as American. Very silly. Anyway, both of those jobs gave me profound pleasure because I was sculpting things that I had put in myself years earlier. This is one of the fundamental pleasures in gardening. This is why it doesn't work so well to go to a garden for nine months or a year. You don't get that, that intense joy that comes with moulding the fruits of your earlier labours. Gardening is very much art in slow motion. And it's like painting a picture in many ways, but a picture where you paint it by selecting your canvas and then mixing your pigments and then waiting for four years for your pigment and binder and whatever else to become paint. And sometimes it doesn't become paint. Sometimes it becomes sludge and you have to throw it away. But sometimes, sometimes it comes the most beautiful paint and you say yes and throw it around and slap it down and you've created a masterpiece. And that surely is one of the most joyous experiences there is out there. Anyway, Tuesday started with another heavy frost. One of those frosts heavy enough to get into the, the middle of the leaves and to turn them into that sort of blanched spinach tone of dark and floppy green. Sometimes you think, how on earth can a leaf survive this? Looking at the begonia, you think, my god, every single cell in that plant has ruptured. There is no way that this thing is coming back. It looks like algae plastered across the rocks. And of course it thaws out and stands up, and it once again is a proud elephant's ear. None the worse, not damaged at all. The remarkable things. I kept myself warm by turning the manual compost heap. This is the compost heap not turned with the digger. And I'm very pleased with it. I haven't turned it for a while, but it feels so much lighter and friable, despite all of the water and all of the wet. It's breaking itself up from its slabbish state into a, a nice muesli-ish state. It's mixing itself together. The, the great big clumps of grass and leaves are combining and it's starting to get those lovely reddish compost worms. I don't know where they come from. There must be there must be eggs on the material that we chuck into the into the heap. But they're there now and their numbers will swell dramatically. We don't get them in the main heap because the temperature's way above thirty five degrees and it's too hot for them and it's too hot for their eggs. We get them in our secondary heap on that side, where we turn the compost into to mature. That's the, the, the cask ageing process for our compost. And those are, those are full of worms. But, but it was really nice to see them in the hand-turned heap. The bracken has gone down perfectly. I think bracken is such a good addition to a heap. It's fantastic for aerating stuff. Those long horizontal fibres it has. Perfect for getting in amongst the, the slabs of grass that come when you've, you've emptied a lot right on mower on top of it. I thoroughly recommend it, and next time I get told off for letting the bracken go out of control, I'm going to say it's a, a crop. Wednesday was a day of cutting back. I was cutting the leaves from the old hellebores, the, the hybrid hellebores, to better show the flowers. And this is one of those jobs that slightly divides gardeners. Some people don't like to do it. There is a disease argument 
that it stops the black spot diseases of the hellebore. We don't have any of those, so I'm doing it for purely aesthetics, just so that you can see the flowers more clearly, and they are a, a brighter, more exciting focal point. I think that you see them from a greater distance without the leathery old leaves around them. When you stand at the top terrace, they really do look like lights set in the flower beds, which I don't think they did when they still had their leaves on them. I only cut the leaves from mature plants, not the kind of hellebore that you see sold in the garden centre in its first couple of years. Which, by the way, I think is why people are put off by hellebores, because they do look so ungainly when they've got three massive leaves on a little one-litre pot, and the leaves are coming out in all different, completely unrelated and uncoordinated directions. They look like those children's pictures you see pinned on, on parents' fridges, where the child's come home from school with a picture of mummy, and mummy's arms come out the side of her head at wildly different angles, and one hand has 18 fingers sticking in all directions, and the other one has three. That's what young hellebores look like. Uh, those kind of things, I'd leave them, leave the leaves on to, to bulk up. They're not going to have significant flowers anyway. So, so let, them, let them carry on, let them get as much as they can out of those leaves. But the big mature clumps, when you've left them for six years and it looks like a hellebore should look, and you want to take all of those people who say, I don't like hellebores, by the ear, and drag them into your garden and say, you don't like this, you don't like this, what's wrong with you? Those are the ones that are worth chopping back. And on those ones, it's, it's quite hard because you might have 30, 40 leaves coming up and, and 25 flower stalks and other plants in the way. And you're bending down and trying to get the leaves off quite, quite far down. And you get this horrible feeling when you've been cutting back 11-month-old leaf stalks for half an hour and suddenly you hit a three-week-old flower stem and your secateurs pass through it as if you carved a jelly instead of the, the roast beef and you think, oops, that is a minuscule fraction of beauty removed from this garden. And so I was looking out for for the, the low-down stems rather than tracing the, the, the leaf from the top all the way down its stem and chopping the same one for the bottom. I was looking for the, the pink rhubarb texture of the newly emerged flower stems. They have that wonderful pink speckling up them. And the old leaves are much more uniform in their green, old, herbaceous maturity. So I took the, took the green ones out, left the pinky rhubarb ones, stood up and saw a, a perfect shining clump of hellebore flowers. Interestingly enough, I'm not an obsessive hellebore pera. I don't go down on my hands and knees and then lie on my back and look up to see the, the distinct specklings inside or the, or the little true petals inside the ornamental lure. I like to see them from above in a massive clump from a distance and I don't think that I would really plant a hellebore for its particularly beautiful dark pattern inside. I am much more of a, a quantity over quality man when it comes to this plant. At the British Library on Thursday, I was conducting research into matters garden historical. Nothing to report, I'm afraid. I went out for a nice lunch. I saw other people at work while I was at lunch. It is quite nice using these Thursdays to go out and see how other people earn their crust. I saw these people in the restaurant we were in, and they were professional cake inspectors, and they had tape measures and set squares and they were measuring angles and, and thickness of of creme patisserie it was very exciting they must have been from from this small chain's head office and they were incredibly incredibly fat men both of them they almost loomed over this little table of the cake between them and you think these are men these are men who enjoy their job as much as i do so that was pleasing to see on Friday I went back to the garden. The, the cool and crisp had gone. The, the January cold and damp had set back in. I was moving some asters around. Asters that are going to lose their flower bed due to redevelopment works in this part of the garden. Some of them had already been prematurely redeveloped. They had been buried by spoil soil. There were just the, the dried stems of last year sticking up from, from a mound of clay. So like a UN rescue dog, 
I dug into the pile and I heaved them out, dug them from the ground and, and moved them elsewhere. They're forming a lovely fibrous mat of stems and all the little leaves are just, are just crawling out of the ground at the moment, spread across quite a wide area. It looks like a, a nest of little green somethings that live underground has been disturbed. Someone's trodden nearby and they're all in the process of going, what's going on up here? And we, we've stopped time in that moment and now I'm going to move them and put them, put them elsewhere in the garden. They're going to fill a spot where some old self-seeded pheasant berries have been given their marching orders. And that was it. The end of another very satisfying week in the garden. We edge ever closer to spring. The irises are out now, the little dwarf irises. Dwarf iris harmony looking particularly good. The other one that is my nemesis, I don't know what cultivar it is, the zombie iris is also out. That one that's very pale and washed out and looks like the pupils of a, of a shambling figure long dead. I have a bet with the owner of the garden as to whether the big daffodils by the compost heap will be out by March the 1st. An unprecedented date for the compost daffodils. He doesn't believe they will be out. I think they will be out. And I think I will win because I have cloches and oil heaters and I can always dig them up and move them to the greenhouse for a bit. And the buds are already out. The buds are there and fat. They're doing that straight up in the air thing that daffodils do before they flower. Straight up. And then they'll slowly crinkle their neck downwards until they look like the bill of a pterodactyle. And then they will flower. So we have a month to, to endactyle these daffodils. I will get it done and I will um, happily spend my winnings on, on buying anyone a drink who, who needs one. No recommendations from me this week, I'm afraid. Time is short. I'm recording this episode at 4.30 in the morning before I go to work. My evening slots with a, with a glass of wine have been taken over by, by the child who, who likes to use that, that particular segment of time for, for his main screaming time. So I am now morning with a with a cup of coffee recording, which I think is, is working absolutely fine. I, I'll carry on doing it this way. Anyway, I must get off and go to work. I have to collect some more anecdotes for the next episode of The Garden Log. I apologise for the short running time today. I promised you I will have some very exciting news and recommendations regarding books and other things next week round. Something for those of you who like magic and murder and plants. I hope that you all have a wonderful time this week, whether you are in the garden or not. If you're not in the garden, I'd suggest now is a good time to go through all of those photos taken last year at gardens visited and gardens owned. And those things you thought, I already must remember that, that you've now completely forgotten. Remember them now. Start ordering, phone up some nurseries and, and get the stock ready because once things get moving again, once that grass is growing, the lawnmower has been started, the weeds are back, then there isn't going to be time for these ideas. This is thinking space. Now is the time to pull some magnificence from the deep, dark corners of your brain. So I will leave you with that as some homework and say thank you very much for listening and goodbye.